You will open your Bibles to Joshua chapter 24. Joshua 24, 15. We're going to read a passage that I trust is familiar to us. As Joshua was winding up his time as a leader in Israel, there would be a new generation that would come along. They've entered into the land of Canaan. He says this to them in Joshua 24, 15. And it seems evil to you to serve the Lord. Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You know, there are a lot of choices that we make in our lives. We make choices on a daily basis. We make a choice what to eat. You know, what are we going to eat for lunch? What are we going to eat for breakfast or dinner or whatever it may be? We make a choice of what clothes to put on day by day. What outfit do I want to wear today? We make a choice to go to work, to engage in business. We make a choice to do dishes or laundry or not do dishes and not do laundry. We make all kinds of choices in our life. We make choices that are good, we make choices that are bad, and we make choices that are neither. They're indifferent. doesn't really matter in the end. But we do make choices. As he's challenging the people of God here, the Israelites, you need to make a choice. What is it that you are going to do? The decisions we make that are good, and we would not change under any circumstances are the ones that bring us encouragement, are the ones that give us strength, if you will. You know, there are choices that we have made that have been very difficult, maybe even scary when we've been thinking about them, about what we need to do, about what direction we need to go, about what selection has to be made. But we were convinced when we made that choice, it was the right thing to do, even though it was hard, even though there was a real challenge before us. And the good choices that we've made, sometimes they have consequences that last a long time. It's not just the lead up to that choice that maybe intimidates us a bit, maybe we're a little bit scared about it, maybe we're a little uncertain about it, but we made it. As time goes by, because we made that choice, there are difficulties, there's trials, there's tribulations. But there are things we can look back in our life and we can say it was worth it, it was the right choice, and I would do it again today if I had to do all over again. And so we want to think about this and we want to look at some examples in the Bible about individuals that made choices that were good choices, the right choices to make and draw lessons and applications for us. The first one is looking at Moses. Remember, Moses decided in Acts chapter 7, it tells us about this fact that he was in the household of Pharaoh. He was raised up with an education of the Egyptians. In Acts chapter 7, verse 22, it says that Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Moses was a great man among the Egyptians. Remember that he lived the first 40 years of his life in Egypt, being raised up as Pharaoh's daughter's son. So the grandson of Pharaoh, the Pharaoh's daughter's son. He was in the royal household and received all the blessings and all the privileges that went along with that, including this very good education. And as a member of that household, he had power and he had wealth. For us, it would be unimaginable wealth that was there before him, that he had access to, that he could basically do whatever he wanted to do as a part of that Egyptian royalty. But then, of course, we know that Moses made a decision one day to leave that and to cast his lot with the people of God. If you go to Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11, and notice here with me verses 24 to 27, where the Hebrew writer is recalling about those of faith in the past and 
the things that they did. And he says of Moses here in Hebrews 11, verse 24, By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. You understand that Moses made this decision. He made this choice. When you read in the book of Exodus, where he saw these two uh, people fighting, one being an Egyptian and one being a Hebrew, that he went and he slew that Egyptian. The reason he did that was not a heat of the moment type of thing, though he did react very strongly to it. The reason he did that is because he had already made up his mind. I am going to be with the Hebrews. I'm going to defend them. I'm going to stand up for them. And he was thinking he would be the one at that time, at 40 years old, to lead them in a rebellion against the Egyptians and to lead them out of that land. Of course, that wasn't God's plan, but that's what he thought. But here's the point. He had already made that decision that he esteemed the reproach of Christ greater than the riches or the treasures that were in Egypt. Now, it's very interesting that he made this decision. Of course, and when he murdered that Egyptian, and then he went out into the desert for 40 years, he came back and agreed to do what God had told him he intended for him to do, to go and to lead those children of Israel out. That when he did that in Exodus chapter 14, after all these great plagues that had taken place, after all these mighty powers and miracles done by God, after all of that, they come up to the Red Sea in Exodus chapter 14. And they're caught between the Red Sea and the army of Pharaoh that is bearing down on the children of Israel. And here's how the children of Israel reacted. In Exodus 14, let's pick up in verse 10. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. So they have seen all these miracles. Moses has been their leader. They followed him out here. And now they have no faith. They think they're trapped. They think there's nothing that can be done. And God has just led them out there. And really Moses, they're thinking, you've led us out here just to die, just to be slaughtered. How do you think Moses felt at that point about these people that he decided, I'm going to cast my lot in with them. I'm going to do something to help them. You get to Exodus chapter 15. Exodus 15, remember verses 22 and following here. It says, So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days into the wilderness and found no water. Now there, when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Marah. And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? You know, we just get a little glimpse here of what we continue to read about through Exodus in the book of Numbers, really. The people just complain and complain and complain about the conditions, the circumstances that they find themselves in. Even though they've been led out of slavery to the Egyptians, out of that bondage, out of the oppression, out of the suffering they were facing, they are just griping and complaining over and over again. And they led rebellions against the leadership of Moses. When the Lord brought them up to the edge of Canaan land in Numbers chapter 14, the spies returned from that and they give the bad report about there's giants in the land and there's walled cities there. And at Numbers chapter 14 verse 1 says, So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, 
If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, let us select a leader and return to Egypt. Yet another time that they're ready to get rid of Moses and go back to Egypt. How do you think Moses felt at that point? I know me personally, why did I do this? They're ungrateful. They have no faith. They can't remember what's happened over the past year and a half or two years at this point with all the miracles in Egypt, crossing over the Red Sea, all the things God has done for them leading them up to the land of Canaan, and now they fall apart. That would be difficult. But let me ask you this. Do you think Moses right now regrets his decision? If we could go and talk to him, Moses, do you regret that you looked to the children of Israel, you looked to God's people, and you said, that's who I'm going to go with. That's who I'm sticking with. That's who I want to help and serve and lead. Well, you know and I know, Moses would not say he regretted that decision. He would say that was the right decision. That was a good decision, a good choice that I made in my life. When you get to the New Testament, of course you read about Moses again and again as he is brought up. In John chapter 3, remember Jesus, as he's referring to himself there, really he says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So Jesus references Moses in pointing to him as a great leader of God's people and how he helped God's people by building that serpent and he delivered them from the death that they were facing there and the Son of Man would deliver us from spiritual death. So he is making a comparison between him and Moses. That's a favorable comparison. And what we're seeing is how Moses is exalted because of his dedication to God and to God's people in spite of all the troubles that he went through. When you get to Acts 7, we read just a little bit ago from Stephen's preaching there and how that he talks about Moses as one that God had chosen. Though the people had rejected, God chose him. And then of course Stephen goes on to make that application to Jesus Christ. God chose him. Though you've rejected him, that's who the Lord has selected. So again, he's compared favorably to Jesus Christ. Then if you would go to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. From my perspective, Matthew chapter 17 is sort of the pinnacle of examples about Moses making the right choice and him being rewarded for that choice as we have a record in the Word of God. In Matthew chapter 17, remember Jesus goes up onto the mountain. He is transfigured and His face shone like the sun and His clothes became as white as light. And in Matthew 17 verse 3 it says, Moses, and behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with Him. Moses was returned from the realm of the dead to stand with Jesus and Elijah and talked to Jesus on this occasion. Luke tells us that they talked about the Lord's coming death in Jerusalem. But Moses was there talking to the Lord. What a privilege, what a blessing that was. So again, do you think Moses would say, I regret the decision I made? Of course he wouldn't say that. He made the right choice. He did the right thing in spite of all the troubles and trials that he faced. Well, what about us in serving God's people and doing the will of God? Will you ever regret becoming a Christian? Will you ever say, I wish I hadn't have done that? The only way you're going to say that is if the devil gets to you and he deceives you. But as a child of God, we need to understand that when we become a Christian, that's a good choice, that's the right choice, and it doesn't matter about the difficulties, the challenges, the trials that come after that choice. It is the very right thing to do. 
As a child of God, we will endure the opposition of the world and we will face trials among brethren. You think about Moses. You know, he faced Pharaoh. And he went to Pharaoh and he said, let my people go. And you know, Pharaoh at times would just say no. And at other times he said, okay, but only a few of you can only take the men. Uh, there's limitations, conditions. Okay, you can go. Then he would change his mind. No, you can't go. And he faced that. So if you will, think of that as Moses facing opposition to the world. But where did most of Moses' troubles come from? It came from the Israelites. That gave him grief again and again and again. And you know what? Where you will face grief among brethren. It's going to happen. But it's still the right choice to be a Christian, to serve God's people, to hang in there and stick it out, press forward, doing what you can to help them to get to the promised land just as Moses did what he could to get the children of Israel to the promised land. It's the right choice. It's the good choice. Then another example that we have is Paul. Paul made the decision to leave Judaism. And let's go to Philippians chapter 3 here. Philippians chapter 3. As we think about Paul's life prior to this decision... In Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 4, it says this, Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless, and he lays out here essentially his pedigree in Judaism. Look at where I was in Judaism. If there ever was someone who could claim to be a true Jew, as he says here, a Hebrew of Hebrews, who is righteous and faithful according to the law, who is zealous on fire, that was Paul. Persecuting the church, going after them with great rage. And you know he had great power as he did this. Back in Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 9, we read about that time of persecution. In Acts chapter 9, verse 1, it says, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And then it tells us how he goes on his way to Damascus. It says he goes to the high priest and he asks for letters, and then it tells us that he went. What does that mean? Just connect the dots. The high priest granted him his request. He had influence with the high priest. Now if you think about the high priest among the Israelites, among the Jews, he was the most powerful and influential man there was. And Paul had his favor, had his trust, had his confidence. In Galatians chapter 2, Paul makes this comment about his life in Judaism. In Galatians chapter 2, if you'll notice here, or rather Galatians chapter 1, Galatians chapter 1 verse 14, he says, And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. He advanced beyond his contemporaries. So others approximately his age, others like him who were raised up at the feet of Gamaliel or some other trusted, respected rabbi, says, I was above them. I exceeded them. He was, if you will, a prodigy. He was a superstar among the Jews. And he was on his way to have great power and great wealth himself. But again, Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Verses 7 and 8. The apostle makes mention of this. After he lists that pedigree, after he lists all those advantages, all those favors that he had in Judaism, he says in Philippians 3 verse 7, But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. 
He gave it all up for the sake of Jesus Christ. You remember 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10, where he's talking about all those people who had seen the resurrected Christ. And he goes on to talk about, you know, last of all, he was seen by me. But then he says that he, Paul, labored more abundantly than they all. Paul was just as zealous for Christ as he was in Judaism. He put that zeal, that fervor, into doing his will and advancing his cause. And because he did that, he became a target of the enemies of God's people. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 2 Corinthians 11, the apostle lists here all the troubles that he had faced up to that point. And this isn't all of them. We can read in the book of Acts and see where there are more troubles and trials that he went through. In 2 Corinthians 11 verse 23, he said this, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews five times I received forty stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen. In perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil and sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides all these things, or the, besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Think about everything that he went through, all the trouble that he faced as he went about preaching the gospel. <laughs> Seeing that opposition, we talked a while ago how Moses faced opposition and difficulty among his own people. Paul here, though he references that he faced opposition among false brethren, he faced difficulties among Judaizing teachers among Christians and different things like that, he faced a lot of troubles from those outside the church. Jews were determined to put him to death at times when he faced Gentiles and their outrage, like Demetrius the silversmith and the riot that took place at Ephesus. He faced all these troubles, all these trials. Do you think Paul right now is happy with his decision? If we could go and ask him, Paul, would you do it all over again? You know and I know he would do it all over again. He would forsake Judaism and embrace Christ again. When we read about his life, he became the most prominent apostle. In fact, Paul was so influential in Christianity that secular historians look back at him as the founder of Christianity, not Christ. They look at Paul as the founder. Now you and I know better. You and I know that Christ established the church. That Christ revealed the message through the Holy Spirit to Paul and the other apostles for them to preach and teach in the world. And that is how the truth advanced and how Christianity spread. But he became the most prominent apostle. He saved countless souls in his lifetime and still through his work today is helping to save souls. You think about that legacy that he left. And because of his faithfulness, because of his dedication to the Lord, Paul could die in peace. In Philippians chapter 1, when he is sitting in jail, by the way, Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, he said, For me, to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. He said, I'm fine. If I die, that's okay. Because he knew he had served the Lord faithfully. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4, this is the second time that Paul was in Roman custody. He was facing a trial before Caesar. The first trial, when he went before Nero, he was let go. This second trial before Nero, he realizes he's not going to be let go. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, he says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. In the time of my departure is at hand, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Paul recognized, even in his lifetime, that there was that crown of righteousness that was awaiting him. 
he made a good choice in leaving Judaism in his old way of life to serve Christ, though he sacrificed and he gave it all up. All those advantages, all those blessings he gave up to face suffering, ridicule, persecution. What about us? What about forsaking a religious heritage that is not what the Bible reveals? Many of our friends and neighbors, even some sitting here now, you left denominationalism. You left something that when you looked in the Word of God, you could not see that written in there. It doesn't have the authority of Jesus Christ. And you decided, I'm going to follow what is written in the New Testament. And you have faced opposition because of that. You faced anger, perhaps, even from family. Because you made a decision, you made a choice. And you made the right choice in spite of whatever difficulties and struggles and trials that you faced since making that choice. You did the right thing, just like Paul did the right thing. Whatever advantages there may have been there that are gone, that's okay. Because you did the right thing. If you had to give up business, maybe a job, or maybe like today a lot of what goes on, you know, over there they had all these services for me. I had a free gym membership, and I had, you know, child care, and had all these things that they offered over there. You know what? That doesn't mean anything. Paul gave up a lot. There are things that we give up to serve the Lord. Giving up that false religion, that old way of life, it's the right thing to do. To serve the Lord as He is revealed in His Word. We also want to look at Rahab. Rahab made a good choice to help God's people. You go to Joshua chapter 2. Joshua chapter 2 where we read about her story unfolding as the children of Israel are getting ready to go into the land of Canaan. Of course, Joshua sent spies into the land. He sent two men to spy out the land to bring back that report and tell him what things looked like and how things were going there. In Joshua chapter 2 verse 1 it says, Joshua the son of Nun sent out two men from Acacia from the Acacia Grove, to spy secretly, go into the land, especially to Jericho. Verse 4 says, Then the woman took the two men and hid them. So she said, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. So these two men that have gone in to spy, they've ended up at Rahab's place. She took them inside, and then when the people of the city came looking for them to get rid of them, she lied about that. The Bible's not approving of a lie here. It's just saying this is what she did. And she hid them and she kept them in secret and she aided them along their way and gave them advice about which way to go. When you get to Joshua chapter 6 and the walls of Jericho come down, Joshua sent those two spies to get Rahab and her family because she had made a deal with them. And they told her, if you keep quiet about us, and being here where we went and did all of that, then when we come and take the city, we will spare you and everybody in your house. So her father and her brothers were there, her family was there, and they spared them. You notice in Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11, the Hebrew writer makes mention of Rahab. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 31 here. By faith, the heart of Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. And she's given here as an example of faith. And Rahab's just mentioned a few places in the Bible. But when she is mentioned, especially after Joshua chapter 6. It's favorable. Always favorable. It still identifies her as Rahab the harlot, so it's not hiding the fact that she at one time was an immoral woman. But it is pointing out 
that she had decided and understood there is Jehovah God who is the God of Israel. He is the Almighty God and she threw in her lot with them. And it went to the point, if you go to Matthew chapter 1, Matthew chapter 1, when we read about the lineage of Jesus Christ, who was it that was in His ancestry? Well, in Matthew chapter 1, if you notice here in verse 5, as it's listing these men, there's only a few women mentioned in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Rahab is one of them. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 5, Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. Obed begot Jesse. Jesse begot David the king and so on. So Rahab went in with the children of Israel, adopted and adapted into that culture. She left her old culture. She left her old community. And her old people in Jericho, how would they have described her? How would they have painted her? She's a traitor. She's a traitor to us all. But how does God see Rahab? God sees Rahab as a great woman of faith to the point that she was privileged to be included in the lineage of Christ. The providence of God brought her into the bloodline of Jesus Christ. That's what kind of woman she was. Did she make the right choice? Yeah, she made the right choice. She made the right choice to leave that old life, that old way, and join in with the people of God. What about us making the choice to leave sin, unrighteousness, and become a part of the people of God? What about leaving sexual immorality as Rahab did? She left that. She put that behind her in her life. What about leaving alcohol, <coughs> drugs, lying, cheating, stealing? What about putting those things out of your life? I'm done with all of that. You know, the devil will try to convince us mm, that's not the right thing to do. You're going to miss out on a lot of fun. But is it the right choice? Yes, it's the right choice to leave sin, to put that behind you in life, to dedicate yourself to doing the will of God and serving God and serving His people, being with them, going through whatever they go through. That's what Rahab did. She made the right choice. And when we become a child of God, we make the right choice as well. If you will, open up to number 488. 488. As you look back on your life, there are no doubt decisions you can look back on and say, I regret that decision. But it's also true you can look back at decisions you've made and recognize that was the right thing. I made a good choice. In spite of whatever difficulties, trials, troubles, consequences that came from that choice, you can still look at it and say that was the right thing. There's no better decision that you can make than to become a child of God, to serve God in your life. Because while we may go through difficulties here, we may face hardships, and people may reject us because of that choice, we have a great and eternal reward awaiting us when this life is over. So if you never made that decision that you want to become a child of God, that you have believed Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that you've confessed that before men, you've turned away from your sin, you've been immersed to have your sins washed away, if you've not done that, do that today. Dedicate yourself to Him. You will not regret that choice. It's the right one. As a child of God, if you made that choice at one time, but the devil's deceived you and drawn you back into his clutches, understand that that was the wrong thing to do. And you can make things right today by making another good choice, repenting of your sins, seeking God's mercy, His forgiveness. If you need to confess that publicly, then come forward and confess it publicly and we will pray with you 
The Lord will receive you. He will forgive you. That's the right thing to do. And when we stand before the Lord on that day of judgment, we will not have any regrets whatsoever having decided to dedicate our lives to Him and remaining faithful to the end. If you need to respond, you need to turn to the Lord. Come now while we stand and sing.